You know the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed some seeds, it fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. When the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. This people's heart has grown dull, and their eyes they can barely hear, and their eye, or with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, Many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. In the Revolutionary War, there was an American major general who earned the highest level of trust from the commander-in-chief, General George Washington, the commander of the armed forces during the colonial war, Revolutionary War. Uh, This war hero had distinguished himself in a number of battles. Uh, Some of those were defensive battles where they were trying to protect Uh, certain strategic areas of the American forces. Other those were offensive uh, maneuvers, uh, especially by capturing uh, Fort Ticonderoga. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but he captured that fort, and that was really important. Along the way, uh, this war hero was even injured, wounded in the course of his duty. Now, as the reward for his bravery, for his service, and even for his sacrifice, General George Washington put this general over command of West Point, Uh, West Point, famous now as the Military Training Academy in New York. Uh, It was a a key strategic stronghold for the American forces at at that time because of its location overlooking the Hudson River. Unfortunately, this man, this decorated war hero's name was Benedict Arnold, a name that has been subsequently associated with treason and treachery because of what he did with this uh, command that he was given. Uh, Benedict Arnold agreed. There are a number of forces dealing with uh, how he came to this point, Uh, but he had agreed to take 20,000 pounds in an agreement to surrender West Point to the British forces. This treason blindsided General George Washington. He never saw it coming. In fact, when they brought to him the documents that exposed the treachery of Benedict Arnold, George Washington was actually on his way to have breakfast with Benedict Arnold to enjoy the company of his friend, so he thought. He absolutely never saw this coming. Now, in the, in the church, 
a lot of times people suddenly blindside us. Not all the time, but every once in a while, if you're in the church for long enough, you'll have people who track with you for long enough. They'll be in the battles right with you. Uh, they'll be right alongside you, shoulder to shoulder, as you're defending the faith. They'll, they'll be with you, maybe in mission outreaches, where you're trying to advance the gospel, wherever Jesus Christ will expand his kingdom. And, and time, time and time, uh, once in a while, you will see some of these people who will suddenly blindside you by, by falling away, by going in a different direction, by walking away from Jesus Christ. People you thought you knew are no longer following Jesus. And we have to ask ourselves, what led to that point? What led to falling away from Jesus? What was going on in this person's life and in this person's heart that this person fell away? The same kinds of questions Washington must have been asking about Benedict Arnold. And then we have to ask, is that the same kind of thing that's going on in my heart? Am I going to be someone who's going to fall away? And Jesus here in this parable, in this story, is explaining to us that the human heart is not as simple as we sometimes think it is. And probably if we're honest about our own hearts, we realize that our hearts are not simple things. We're often moving in a number of different directions, uh, wanting different things at different times, believing, disbelieving, doubting, strong in our faith at different times. And so we're wondering, how is it that our hearts and the status of those hearts are aligning with what Jesus is warning about here. Will I be someone who will bear good fruit? Or will I be someone who walks with you all for a while and then goes my own way? In this story, Jesus is not so much asking us to speculate on different motives and different places where people are coming in their lives. Jesus is calling all of us to cut through these factors and to focus on the one thing that is needful, namely, to hear and understand the word of the kingdom. That's our big idea for this morning. Hear and understand the word of the kingdom. That's what this whole parable is about that Jesus is teaching us. Now, as we look at this parable, again, as I mentioned, we're going to look at the parable of the sower and then we are going to look at the parable of the sower explained in verses 18 through 23. We're going to skip verses 10 through 17 because it's too much to cover all of that in one day. And I didn't want to start with the parable of the sower and then later have Jesus' interpretation of the parable of the sower just by going in consecutive order. Um, he should tell us what this parable means instead of having me try to imagine something for you. So we're going to look at both of those passages, even though they're slightly out of order as we take up this text. But as we look at this, we're going to look at these four different kinds of soils, and Jesus tells us that these are four different kinds of hearts. First of all, we are going to see the unyielding heart, the unyielding heart. Second, the unrooted heart, the unrooted heart. Third, the uncommitted heart, and committed heart. And then fourth, the unencumbered heart, the unencumbered heart. So the first thing we're going to look at is the unyielding heart, uh, looking at verses 1 through 4 as the introduction to the parable and the first part of the parable, as well as verses 18 and 19 where Jesus gives the first part of his interpretation of his parable. Now once again, well, we came out of Matthew 12, and I was constantly reminding us of the context of Matthew 12 because it's so important uh, throughout Matthew 12, and now it's going to be important as we continue into Matthew 13. Namely, Matthew 12 was all about spiritual warfare. Jesus the King has come into the world to bring the kingdom into the world. And it should be no surprise that as the King comes to bring the kingdom in this world, that he is attacked on every side by forces that oppose him. And Jesus doesn't want us to mistake the kinds of forces that he's talking about. He's talking about full-on demonic forces that are attacking him. He's casting out forces. He's talking about demonic forces that will come back to re-attack people. He's talking about the full-fledged attack that is going to come on the expanding kingdom of heaven as it comes. And now, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, is going to talk about the nature of this kingdom. If this kingdom is being opposed on all sides by these demonic forces, what exactly is the kingdom? And so, he's going to give us a lot of parables in Matthew chapter 13 that's going to talk about the nature of the kingdom how to enter the kingdom, the value of the kingdom, how the kingdom is growing up even when we cannot see it doing so. And this first story that Jesus is going to tell us, like the others, is in the form of what is called a parable. A parable is a short story 
uh, using very ordinary kinds of events uh, that is meant to illustrate deep and profound spiritual truths. Now, parables have been interpreted a different way in different times. If, if you know much about church history, in the medieval ages, parables were the wild subject of uh, allegorical speculation. Uh, you know the parable of the prodigal son, or, or the, uh, the, the parable of the, the, the uh, Good Samaritan, rather, where the Good Samaritan has to help the, the, the poor Israelite who has been wounded by robbers on the road, has to help him into an inn. Well, in the medieval age, they would say, well, the, the oil is uh, baptism, and the inn, that refers to the church, and the innkeeper, that's St. Paul watching over him with the epistles of St. Paul, and it went on and on and on. Now, all kinds of speculation about what that would be. Well, as time went on, people thought, well, maybe that's too much. In most of the 20th century, in the earliest part of the 20th century, the pendulum swung wildly to the other side where people said, no, parables have one point and one point only. So this parable, this is only about the fact that the kingdom will eventually bear fruit, even if it doesn't always bear fruit in all the places it's sown. And then people said, well, but shouldn't we pay attention to the different side, different kinds of soils that are presented here? And they would say, no, one point only. Well, thankfully, the pendulum has swung a little bit back to the middle. And now interpreters largely look at stories like this, and they say, okay, obviously there are allegorical details. As we look at the way Jesus interprets this parable, he is making different points about the different kinds of soils. This is Jesus telling us. This isn't just us making up what these different soils might represent. And so we're seeing some kinds of detail that Jesus is bringing out, but we have to be careful not to read too much into these parables. And that'll be my attempt this morning, and as we go through the parables, I've written more in the sermon notes, but if you have any questions about these parables as we're going through them, please feel free to ask. That brings us to the beginning of this passage and this first great parable of the kingdom. Read in verse 1, that same day, again, there's a tight connection that's being made with what came before. All of the swirling controversy that Jesus has been teaching as he's been casting out demons, as he's been accused, as using the power of the prince of demons to do all of this. All of this now leads Jesus to explain the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And so we read that he went out of the house and he sat beside the sea. And then we read great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. In those days, teachers sat Obviously, it's different today. In our culture, teachers stand, and the rest of you all get to sit. But in those days, teachers sat, and Jesus sat specifically in a boat so that he could uh, go a little bit away from the shore and have a wide range of his audience as the, wa- as the sound went over the water and went to people who were spread out along the shore. We should notice here that in these parables, Jesus is speaking to the crowds. Most of the time, he's speaking to his disciples, and in the last chapter, very often we saw him butting heads with the religious leaders, but here, it's neither of those groups. The disciples are there, we know, because in verse 10, Jesus begins to speak to them. The disciples are there, but in, in general, Jesus is here speaking to the crowds. And notice that we read that Jesus told them, verse 3, many things in parables, Later on in verse 34, we're going to read that he spoke to them only through parables. And if you were listening when we were reading in verses 10 through 17, the reason for teaching in parables is not because a a good story is something that people really like and can listen to. Jesus told parables because he wanted his message to be veiled to those whose hearts were not the kind of good soil where his message could land and rise and bear fruit. Jesus wasn't trying to send his message out to a mass audience. He wasn't trying to go viral. Jesus spoke to the crowds in ways that veiled his message because they weren't ready for it. Either they weren't ready for it at this time and they would become later ready, or these are people who were just there trying to hear something new and were not at all interested in believing what the king was telling them about the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus now begins to speak his first parable. In verse 3, he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. Now, very clearly, even though Jesus doesn't explicitly explain this in verses 18 through 23, very clearly Jesus is the sower. 
And along those lines, uh, following in his footsteps, anyone who's uh, preaching and proclaiming the gospel, uh, whether in public or in private, uh, these are little sowers, people who are coming along behind Jesus to share the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of King Jesus. Uh, But here originally, Jesus is the sower who went out to spread the word of the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus explains these seeds are in verse 19. And so then Jesus begins to say that these seeds, as the sower was scattering the seeds, fell on different kinds of soil. In verse 4, he says, as he sowed, this is the first kind of soil, some seeds fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. So here you think about a farmer who's going out to sow these seeds, a farmer who has uh, had these footpaths that he walks along, and as these footpaths are ways where you don't want to walk all over your crop, so you probably have specific places you're going to walk along the path, and and these are through long use, season after season. These are hard packed. These are packed down. These are compressed parts of the soil, and the seed doesn't fall into rich, luxurious, um, damp soil. The seeds fall and just skittle across the surface on this hard, packed-down soil on the path. And because they don't sink in, the birds have free reign to sort of descend down, swoop down, and to devour all of these seeds before the seeds might, maybe in a rainstorm, find a way to penetrate the the surface of the soil and to go down and to grow up later. What Jesus says this means in verse 19 is he says, this is like when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. Who then are the birds? Well, he says, the evil one, like the birds, comes and snatches away what has been sown in his hearts or in their hearts. Now, uh, Linsky is not necessarily, uh, Linsky argues that we shouldn't necessarily see these individual birds as individual demons in the plural coming to take away the message of the kingdom. Uh, What he argues, and I I think this is probably a better way to interpret this, is that Jesus is talking about the varying different tactics the evil one uses to snatch the word away from our hearts. If you think about it, some people, when they hear the word of God, they respond from a place of pride. I don't need that. I'm better than that. This isn't something that affects me. This isn't something that I am weak enough to need. Or you think about people with other religious or philosophical commitments. People who uh, say, I believe something different, therefore I cannot believe in Jesus as the Messiah. I cannot believe in him as the Son of God because I already have my other religion over here. Or uh, maybe a philosophical commitment of scientific materialism, of atheism, where we only believe that this world in its material form is all that exists. There's nothing spiritual. Therefore, I cannot believe that the Son of God came down from heaven. That would also prevent the Word of God from penetrating our hearts. Or what about busyness? Long periods of time where we are so focused on our own work, on our own businesses, on our own um, labors, on our own studies, wherever you might be, I'm just too busy. I don't have time to give any consideration to this. Or in our culture, sexual immorality is a, is a large part of what hardens hearts against hearing the need for the gospel. The scriptures give warning that sexual immorality puts particular kinds of hooks in our hearts that keeps us from responding with a soft heart of faith to the gospel. Whatever the reason is, whatever the tactics that the evil one is using, in every case, what we are seeing is an unyielding heart. This hard soil represents an unyielding heart that refuses or simply does not yield to the gospel of Jesus. The key characteristic here that Jesus is bringing out about this hard heart is that there's no response, not at the beginning, and presumably not for the foreseeable future, unless the word of God comes along again, and the soil is somehow cultivated, broken up, softened. But in its current state, this particular kind of soil represents a heart that is unyielding. Now, if you've ever shared the gospel with someone, you've probably had an experience of coming up against an unyielding heart. When you share the gospel with someone, so often the conversation is over before it actually begins. I remember once taking a friend out to lunch. I've I've told this story in part before because it's so helpful for me to think about what may be happening in those states. But I took a friend out to lunch that I hadn't seen for a while, and we got to talking about a lot of different things. I've been praying that God would be working in his heart, cultivating the soil to prepare for the word of the gospel to penetrate this young man's life. And I was talking to him, and as we talked about the gospel, and we talked about sin, 
and the need for forgiveness. Every step we took, every part of this conversation this took, you could just see this young man closing down. You could see his countenance darkening. You could see his refusal, his unyielding, hard heart, not wanting to believe the gospel. I walked away from that lunch very discouraged, very dejected, praying that God might still work. And what I'm happy to say is, I saw that same friend a few months later. I thought the conversation had ended our friendship forever. But I saw him a few months later, and I saw him in a church. <laughs> in the subsequent, in subsequent intervening months, someone else had led him to Christ. And I tell you that to say, initially when I encountered him, his heart was hard. But the work of God in the gospel can break up the hardest hearts. In fact, one of the great promises about the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing the gospel into hard hearts is in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, where the process of bringing a hard-hearted sinner to come to know Jesus is described as taking out a hard, stony heart from someone and giving that person back a soft heart of flesh. Sometimes in the Bible, flesh is a word that refers to sin, but not in that context. In that context, it's contrasting. It's talking about the same reality that Jesus is talking here. We need not hard hearts that are unyielding to the gospel. We need soft hearts of broken up soil where the seed can come and and, and find a place to, to, to penetrate the surface of our hearts and to grow up in us. The soil has to be cultivated. And that's a promise that God gives us in the way that he brings the gospel to bear on the hearts of sinners. Well, in this first soil, we read about someone who is entirely unyielding, and that makes some sense, right? We have someone who simply rejects the word, and we understand, well, that's a bad thing. The evil one is taking the word away from that person. But in the next two examples, Jesus is moving from sort of a categorical, does not receive the gospel, to two examples of where people believe for a time and then fall away. And again, this is like the story of Benedict Arnold, someone who was faithful for a time and eventually treacherously walked away. This is where the questions arise, and this is what we need to pay special attention to, especially in our own lives, especially if you're here this morning. So first of all, uh, the second soil is that we're going to deal with the unrooted heart in verses 5 through 6, and then verses 20 through 21. Jesus says in verse 5, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depths of soil. When the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Now again, Jesus is talking about the growth of the gospel in someone's life. And he's talking about the sun, something about the sun, we'll have to get to that in a moment, coming out and and scorching the faith that is growing in this person to the point where this person's faith withers away. And again, we have to ask, How would someone fall away from their faith like this? What kind of faith is this? Is this something that I need to be worried about for myself? And so Jesus tells us exactly what he means by this image in verse 20 and 21. He says, as for what is sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And he has no root in himself but endures for a while, and where tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. The person begins, and they receive the word with great joy. Immediately, there's a reception. Maybe the initial conversation of the gospel isn't over as soon as it starts, but someone immediately, hungrily, grasps at this word of the gospel and runs with it. But then something happens. They encounter some kind of external opposition, tribulation or persecution. And one commentator, Nolan, says that tribulation means trouble that puts someone under pressure. It puts you under pressure. Are you really going to continue to be faithful with this even when things get hard? That's the question here. And what, again, Lenski, I've quoted him already this morning. I quote him a lot. He's a wonderful commentator. What he observes, and I think this is really helpful, is that both in this soil and the previous one, the hard-hearted soil. In both cases, there is a hardness. In the first case, it was a case where the entire surface of the ground was hard and packed down, so the the seeds just scattered over them. 
But in this case, there's another hardness, but it's hidden. It's hidden by a very thin layer of soil. What looks to be like good, receptive soil and quick growth in the life of the faith of this person encounters underneath an unyielding hardness, which allows no roots to be laid down deeply. There's two kinds of hard hearts, the unyielding heart as well as the unrooted heart. The unrooted heart is also hard-hearted, but it doesn't arise, it doesn't appear, it doesn't present itself as hard until these pressures and difficulties come. I think that's one of the saddest things that I see as a pastor, about people who come along with great joy to Jesus, but then they're drawn away because of outside pressure. In college, um, I knew a young man who had left the Mormonism of his family in order to follow Jesus. Um, The Mormon religion proclaims a Jesus. They, um, to some degree, follow the scriptures. They have other uh, scriptures, what they would call, to add more information about who Jesus is. And in the process of what they've done to the scriptures and the process of these other books, uh, they thoroughly corrupt what the scriptures actually teach about who Jesus is, especially the relationship of the eternally begotten Son to the Father. It is not Christianity. It is something entirely different. It is a cult that leads people away from Christianity. And this young man had come to know Jesus, the true Jesus of the Scriptures, and we rejoiced as a church that he was leaving this lifestyle of Mormonism, this family of Mormonism, in order to follow Jesus. We came alongside him. We discipled him. It was a really great success story in the church, but I went off to seminary for a year. When I came back after that summer, I was so heartbroken to know that in that time, the family pressures had become too much. Could not leave his family behind, and so he'd returned to the Mormon church. It was a lot of sorrow as we thought about what that might mean. But that's important. The family pressures that we have are extremely significant. If you remember the passage that we looked at last week, it was Jesus insisting that as important as the earthly family is, it cannot compare with the spiritual family. If following Jesus means leaving your earthly family behind, Jesus says, there's no comparison. You must do it. My friend, fell away because of the tribulations. Maybe you're falling away to this morning, and you need to hear this warning, maybe from family, maybe from pressures in your work or the people that you hang out with, the pressures that come outside you asking you, can you really believe what this ancient book teaches about a man who was supposedly crucified and died and rose from the dead. Is that something you can believe even when people start poking at you because of it? Jesus is warning against a heart that is unrooted, that eventually wilts and falls away. But of course, external threats are not the only kinds of threats to faith. In the next section, the third section, Jesus begins to speak about the uncommitted heart, where the pressures don't so much come from the outside, but from the inside. Not external tribulation, but internal desires that would lead us somewhere different. And so we read in verse 7, other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. These seeds fell among thorns, the thorns grew and choked them. And as one commentator notes, the growth of the thorns proves that there's nothing wrong with this soil. The problems of the two previous kinds of soil, the the hardness of the packed down path or the rockiness of the other soil, which had a hidden hardness, those problems don't exist in this soil. There's plenty of dirt for plants to grow in it. The problem, though, is there's already something growing there. There are these thorns, these weeds that are growing up and taking away water and nutrients to choke out life from the seed the good seed that's trying to bring fruitfulness to the lives of these people. And so who are these people? Well, Jesus says in verse 22, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Now, if you know much about Benedict Arnold, you may know that this is his story, not spiritually speaking, um, but um, in terms of his uh, treachery against the United States. 
He was a very ambitious man, and he became embittered that he felt that he was passed over over by a number of uh, promotions that he should have received before he was eventually put over West Point, and by then it was too late. He married a woman who was a royalist sympathizer, and that eventually led to his eventual treachery. He had these internal desires, both for riches and in terms of romance, that led him away from his faithfulness to his country. But the same thing can absolutely happen spiritually in the uncommitted heart. When we have these other internal desires that choke out our commitment to Jesus, these desires that we want more than we want Jesus, that keep us from bearing fruit in our lives. And maybe you're wondering, what's this grain? What's this fruit? What are we talking about? Well, the Bible tells us a lot about what that means. In Galatians, we read Paul writing about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, all of those kinds of things. It means the personal growth in holiness, the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But it also means taking the part of scattering the seed into new lives, sharing the gospel, to see areas where Jesus will bring his gospel to new people, where he will begin his process of helping them to grow up in the faith. I think this story of the uncommitted heart is the one that we see most often. The great tragedy and greed or lust or other kinds of desires for something sinful draw people away. I remember when I was uh, in college, again, I listened to a popular Christian musician. Um, his songs were, were things that I've listened to a lot. I learned a lot about the gospel from him. Uh, but at some point, um, even though this is a man that I looked up to in a lot of ways, at some point it came out that this man had had an affair. His wife divorced him, but rather than ever repenting from this, his faith simply deconstructed. He just went away. He stopped believing the gospel altogether, and, and now he defiantly asks whether God will ever bring him to faith. He knows enough of these kinds of stories to know, well, if God isn't going to let me believe, then I guess I'm not going to believe. But that's not what the gospel tells us. Jesus is calling us to faith. It's not an excuse. I guess God just didn't do it. And I've seen this play out in the life of friends. I only know of one other believer in my high school youth group who is still walking with the Lord. It played out in ministry leadership. One of my own pastors I saw once walk away for similar reasons from the faith. He constructed, never came back. There are all kinds of things in our culture that our culture is saying, your internal desires is the truest part of you. Express those things and you'll be happy. And Jesus warns us, those are thorns that will choke out life from the word of the gospel in your soul. What Jesus wants us to see in these first three soils is that in a variety of different ways, the word of God is prevented from becoming fruitful in different lives either through hard-hearted unyieldingness or rocky unrootedness or thorny uncommittedness. In each of the cases, there is no fruitfulness. In some cases, there's spurts of parent growth. But because there is no fruit, all of these three stories deal with the worthless growth of the gospel in someone's life or lack thereof. We have to ask what kind of soil is needed for what Jesus is after, namely, what kind of soil is needed to grow and bear the fruit of the kingdom of heaven in someone's life? And this brings us to the fourth kind of soil, the unencumbered heart, in verses 8 through 9. Here we read about good soil that produces grain. In verse 8, Jesus says, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And in verse 23, Jesus says, as for it was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another case sixty, in another case thirty. What's interesting here is that while varying degrees and appearances of fruitlessness were all unacceptable, the first three soils produced unacceptable fruitlessness, notice here that all of these plants produce fruit, but there are varying kinds of yields. Jesus is not asking whether you have reached the standard of someone else. He doesn't want us to be comparing our lives to one another. He knows that some have different opportunities, different gifts, different resources. That's not the point. The point is, are you fruitful at all, period? Is the Word of God growing up in your life, bringing about God's purposes for you? And this is where Jesus wants us to really ponder our own lives. 
He who has ears, let him hear. We might ask them, what's the difference? What's the difference between this last fourth good soil and all the other three soils that did not produce fruit? The difference is the humility to acknowledge that I am a worthless, guilty sinner, a worm who deserves condemnation, so that I am utterly without hope except, except because of God's sovereign mercy. I have nothing to commend me. I have nothing to to advance me. I have nothing to cling to that can save me for this life or the next. I need God to do something if I am going to be saved. See, that's the gospel realization that breaks up the hardness of our hearts. I can't be prideful if I know that I am in standing in deserving, worthy condemnation of the infinite wrath of God. This is the kind of gospel realization that removes the hidden rocks that would keep us and, uh, from, from following Jesus and would rather lead us to fall away. It's the recognition, Jesus, I have these things, these pressures that are going to press in on me. Remove those rocks from my heart so that you can lay down roots in my heart in the gospel. Finally, this is the gospel realization that tears out the thorns that choke out our faith. Our application here this morning is yield the gospel word of King Jesus. Jesus is telling us about the, the, the gospel, the word of the kingdom, and he wants us to yield to this gospel. The point is very simple of this parable. We must yield in faith to this word of the kingdom. The word of the kingdom, that the eternal son of God, though he was in very form God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, But he emptied himself by taking on a human form, that being found in the likeness of men, in the fashion of men, he humbled himself in obedience all the way to death, even death on the cross. But he was born, he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross for our sins, he was buried, and then on the third day, he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. So that as Bob led us this morning, even this morning, even when it's not Easter Sunday, he is risen indeed. This is the whole hope of the gospel. That after 40 days after Jesus was risen, he ascended into heaven. That's a a story. The ascension story is a story of our king ascending up to his throne at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And now he is reigning there, our king. And do you know what he's doing? He is building a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell. That's what the church is called. A temple for the Holy Spirit in which to dwell. Or Paul talks about in the passage that we were reading about earlier. It's not only a, a temple it's, uh, that we are building up, but it's also a garden. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we read in our confession of sin. It's a temple and it's a garden for God to raise up people by the growth of the word of God in our hearts that we might bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What the gospel confronts us with is the fact that our sin excludes and disqualifies us from this kingdom. Our sin condemns us in the sight of a holy God, but that God, being rich in mercy, held out his son, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, gave him over into the hands of wicked sinners to be crucified so that whoever believes in Jesus would be saved. And your sins could be forgiven. And you could be, through Christ, qualified to enter into the inheritance of the kingdom of light. Will you then yield to this gospel word? What is the condition of your heart today? Is your heart unyielding as you sit here? Consider then how the word, the evil one, is, is, is snatching away the word in various ways from your heart. The day of your salvation has drawn near. As you listen to the word of Jesus Christ announcing the salvation of his kingdom, will you let it slip away this morning? Pray. Pray for God to take out that hard heart of stone and give you instead a soft heart of flesh to remove and break up the hardness of the soil of your heart and give you soft, rich soil in which the word of God can take root. Or is your heart unrooted in the word of the kingdom with that rocky soil? Consider, don't, not, don't consider then today whether you are here. Well, I'm here, aren't I? Ask yourself about where you'll be tomorrow. What's going to happen when pressures invariably will come into the world? When persecution and tribulation stands at your door? You know, the Lord's Day, week by week, when we are given this opportunity to gather, is a day for laying down deep roots in the word of the kingdom. A day when we can drink deeply deeply 
from the riches of the water that God gives to his people to quench our thirst so that when the drought comes, when the heat comes, when the sun comes out, bringing trials and tribulations into our lives, we will not wilt. But rather we will be like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Pray then for grace that through the word of God you might be rooted and established in the faith. Finally, is your heart uncommitted to the word of the kingdom? What desires, even this moment, as you're thinking about what you're going to do next, as you're thinking about what you've been doing this week, what are the desires that are even this moment drawing you away from King Jesus? The gospel announces that we don't have to let those desires just passively sit there as they fester and, and lay down their own roots of weeds in our lives. Jesus tells us that we can repent from the sin that arises in our hearts before we ever act upon it. And Jesus promises true spiritual transformation for those who ask him. Repent then from your sinful, unbelieving, lustful, desirous, greedy heart. Pray that God would transform you, tearing out those weeds from the inside out. What Jesus is calling us to is the one thing needful. Let your heart be unencumbered by anything in this world or in your heart. They were in the same position as those crowds who listened to Jesus teach. Therefore, let he who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to know Jesus, that you would help us to worship him, and that this morning you would break up or remove the rocks or tear out the thorns that are plaguing our hearts and preventing us from being fruitful. This is your Holy Spirit's work in our lives, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would be mighty in our midst. We pray that you would bring those who have never come to know Jesus to faith this morning, and that you would bring back from the brink those who are wandering, and that you would strengthen and establish all those who are following him. We pray this in Christ's name.